microphone, that would be great. So just at the bottom of your conference, I'll cover your mouth. Sorry. Okay, Paul, like, oh, yeah, you're ready to go. Sorry, I got a lot of noise, people talking in the background on the thing. That's okay. So uh, what I want to do is run through influenza vaccines and what's happening. The focus is really on those vaccines that I expect to be available here in the next year or two. Uh, I'm not going to cover those things that are really five or ten years away. Uh, you know, so there's nothing about uh, uh, DNA vaccines or the universal vaccine. And I really want to uh, uh, give an overview. So I'm assuming that there are some people on the video conference today who aren't uh, influenza experts. And for those that are, I'm sorry, there's probably some basic uh, background information that uh, uh, is going to be here uh, as part of it. So um, to start, um, to disclosures, uh, I've been involved in influenza research in the past as a director of CDC uh, at Western Australian Health. I was the co-sponsor with CSL and Sanofi of the Western Australian Influenza Vaccine Effectiveness Study in Children, uh, which has been conducted by the Vaccine Trials Group in Perth. Uh, I was also the recipient of an unfettered grant in aid from Novartis, uh, which was the subject of the comparative research, uh, part of which I'll discuss looking at the effectiveness of adjuvanted vaccines in the elderly. Um, I've received travel support for presentations and advisory board meetings from both GSK and Novartis. Uh, I'm a director of the Influenza Specialist Group. Uh, and I'm a member of the Australia Pacific Alliance for the Control of Influenza. Um, my other disclosure is that I make no secret of the fact that I am an advocate for the use of vaccines uh, and particularly the use of uh, influenza vaccine. So what I want to start with is the background and that's the dogma that circulates amongst some parts of the public and even some parts of the health profession itself. And that is that influenza is not a serious disease. Influenza vaccine does not work. And influenza vaccine is not safe. So what I want to cover today is influenza itself, uh, the burden of disease with the focus on those groups that are at risk, the current influenza vaccines in Australia, which are largely trivalent inactivated vaccine, and on the private market this year, quadrivalent vaccine of similar uh, ilk. And then I want to spend a little bit of time at the end talking about uh, the new vaccines that I expect will be here shortly, adjuvanted vaccines, particularly the um, MF59 TIV, um, high dose vaccines, the 60 microgram vaccine, and live attenuated influenza vaccines. So if we talk about the disease itself uh, to begin with, uh, influenza is one of the orthomyxoviridae family. Um, six of these got feedback. Okay, that's stopped. Great. Uh, three of which are influenza viruses. The structure of the virus is relatively similar, although influenza A and B have different uh, protein coats, uh, and the distribution varies from year to year. But overall. Um, it's about 60% H3N2, 15% H1N1, and 25% B. If we look at the influenza virus itself, uh, it has um, a classification based on its surface proteins, and those surface proteins are uh, the hemagglutinin and the neuraminidase proteins. Uh, this is largely a uh, bird virus. There are 18 H types and 11 N types. Uh, at the moment, only really H1N1 and H3N2 are in widespread circulation in humans. H2N2 has previously been in circulation, but isn't at the moment. And there are a number of other types that cause occasional disease, sporadic disease, but don't appear to be able to, at this point, move from human transmission, H5N1, H7N9 in China at the moment, and so on. So the characteristics of the virus are that there are frequent changes of the virus coat and point mutations, and it is able to exchange genetic 
molecular strains. And that genetic material change consists largely of two types of change. Antigenic drift, which is, if you like, a shuffling of the antigens within influenza subtypes to produce a new subtype, but not substantially different for what had been circulating. And occasionally, either by random mutation or by reassortment in other animals, principally pigs, we get substantial antigenic change to the extent that we call uh, a major change which can then produce to a pandemic in that particular time. By comparison, influenza B, which is very similar um, in its structure, has no capacity to undergo the same sorts of massive reassortment, but it does have, since around about uh, the early 1980s, two distinct lineages, the Yamagata and Victoria lineage, and it's unclear uh, in any given year whether we will see one or the other, or in fact a mix of both, or any in particular. So the pathogenesis is, is relatively straightforward. Uh, it's usually respiratory droplets that are inhaled, although you can actually uh, acquire it through mucous membranes. Uh, systemic effects of fever, headache, malaise, myalgia, uh, and respiratory tract symptoms, often an unproductive cough uh, and a sore throat. And this is a disease that, uh, from a clinical presentation, uh, can be either relatively mild, uh, when we do zero surveys of the population, we find that there are more people who've had the flu than recognise that they've had it. But in many people, this can be quite severe. Uh, they can be off work for a week. They can be laid up. And there are a lot of substantial complications, particularly in children, in the elderly, and in people with uh, other chronic diseases where a worsening of their cardiac disease or their neurological disease uh, can be part of it. If we look at the epidemiology of, uh, of influenza and if we concentrate on the epidemiology in Australia itself, uh, this is a three-year period between 2006-07 uh, uh, for notifications and 2005-07 for hospitalisations. And this is a relatively uh, constant pattern. The notifications are very high in early childhood uh, and the hospitalisations uh, high in particularly the naught to ones, but then the other group where there's a lot of notifications is when you add them up to 65 and up, uh, and overall it's those two groups that are the most important. The notifications per year, and this is uh, uh, the last five years, uh, November 2009, sorry, January 2009 to uh, the end of last year. And you can see that it does vary from year to year. 2009 was the pandemic year where there was uh, a large peak, um, a large high peak within a particular week. But if you look at 2014, uh, last year was the highest number of notifications ever uh, seen in Australia with 68,000 notifications and it was even more than the pandemic year. So it was a very... Um, high year for an incidence of, uh, of disease from influenza. Uh, and that was followed up by a very severe year in the Northern Hemisphere last Northern winter. Um, if we look at the next slide and look at the um, notifications by subtype, um, what you see is that often we don't actually get a subtype, but there was a mix last year of H3N2, H1N1, and later on in the season, uh, a mix B as well. Uh, this is another look at the notification by subtype and age group last year. And again, this is a fairly constant pattern for a mixed year. Notifications high in the young, high in the old. Um, if you look at the orange bar next to the red bar, uh, and those orange bars are H1N1, and you see that they're highest in the very young, and H1N1 tends to uh, affect younger age groups more than older age groups. If you look at the yellow bars, that's influenza A, H3N2, and it tends to affect older persons much more than younger persons. And so in a bad H3N2 year, 
we will see lots of nursing home outbreaks, lots of hospitalisations of the elderly. And in H1N1, we see the reverse uh, pattern. We still see disease in the elderly, but we'll see more children. And if you look at the two H1N1, uh, California 09, the pandemic, and then subsequent um, high H1N1 years, we saw lots of impact in um, people between the ages of 19 and 64, particularly pregnant women and people that were overweight. So that there's a different pattern as to who is most at risk depending on what the circulating strain is uh, in that given year. Um, this is the hospitalisations and again influenza A either specific or subtype is the vast majority. And if you look at the shaded areas, which are the ICU admissions, uh, you're seeing it's mainly influenza A that are going to, to that. And so a summary of the burden of disease uh, in Australia. Uh, last, it's around about 1,500 to 3,500 deaths per year. Lots of debate about how accurate these sort of figures are. Uh, they're modelling figures. The majority of people who pass away from influenza uh, are not tested and are not recognised as being influenza. Uh, the virus itself has a lot of impact on other body symptoms. Uh, it interferes with coagulopathy and therefore increases your likelihood of having a cardiac event and so on. Um, of the 68,000 last year, 14,000 in children less than 10 years of age, um, and 2,500 in adults over 85 years of age. Last year, 18,000 hospitalisations, 10% um, were admitted to intensive care. Most of those last year had medical comorbidities uh, and were older because it wasn't a big H1N1 uh, year last year. So the key subgroups are relatively well known uh, to people. It's the elderly, and as we increase uh, with age, the risk increases. Uh, it's children, particularly very young children, but also children under the age of one. Uh, those people with chronic disease and a whole range of chronic diseases. Uh, pregnant women, uh, and I still struggle with some of my general practitioner colleagues who see pregnancy as some sort of uh, divine state that you shouldn't do anything to and are un willing to provide influenza vaccine or pertussis catch-ups or anything to pregnant women. And really since 2009, uh, a much greater understanding since the pandemic that people who are overweight, and particularly those who are obese, uh, are more likely to have very severe consequences of influenza disease. So we have a national immunisation program and it provides free influenza vaccines to a portion of for those people who are um, at high risk. It first states that influenza vaccine is recommended for anybody over six months of age who would like to reduce their likelihood of becoming ill. In particular, the following groups have free vaccine, uh, individuals who have a chronic predisposition, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children from six months to five years, all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people over 15, pregnant women and individuals over the age of 65. So those groups as well as being at high risk are in fact entitled to free influenza vaccine under the National Immunisation Program. <clears throat> Other groups where it's strongly recommended but it is not provided free uh, include those people who may potentially transmit influenza, healthcare providers, staff of nursing homes and household contacts of individuals in high-risk groups. Uh, children aged less than five years, generically, although it is free for Indigenous children. Residents of residential aged and long-term care facilities, uh, homeless people, people providing essential services, people involved in the poultry or pork industry, some specific industries and travellers. So these are essentially groups that we recommend, but at the background to that is a view from the NHMRC that really anybody who'd like to reduce their risk should go and have an influenza vaccine. Uh, I just want to concentrate on a couple of these groups that I think are probably uh, under-recognised. 
Um, firstly, children under five, Australia is really one of the few developed places that does not offer influenza vaccine to all children under five. It's a fiscal decision that's been made. Um, in the United States, every child up to 18 is offered free flu vaccine. Uh, Canada varies in its provinces as to which, who gets what, but everybody up to five everywhere. Uh, in the United Kingdom, they're offering the new live vaccine to every child over the age of uh, uh, under the age of 18. So uh, this was part of a campaign we ran in Western Australia. Um, the year after uh, we had this particular incident, um, there were three children, otherwise well, toddlers uh, between the ages of 18 and 30 months, all within a single week, uh, had no other condition, were feeling a little bit off colour, uh, didn't have their dinner, uh, parents were concerned, thought they'd put them to bed and check on them in the morning. Uh, in the morning, two of them had passed away and the third one passed away in the emergency department after that. Uh, this shut down Princess Margaret Hospital for six weeks uh, while we tried to track down what was special about these children or that flu strain. Uh, and what it turned out was that these children you know, probably had some sort of cytokine storm, but uh, they died without a secondary bacterial infection rapidly by getting influenza. Uh, and this is pretty well known elsewhere. Uh, on average in the United States where they have a sentinel system looking at this, influenza and its complications lead to over 100 childhood deaths every year and half of these children have no underlying illness. Uh, and so I can never understand why people say flu is no big deal. Uh, I look at what happened in the United States and in Australia with the pertussis response. Uh, in 2009 in the US there were 50,000 cases of pertussis when the, you know, the perfect storm of less effective acellular vaccine with declining immunisation rates produced outbreaks. 12 children died and there's been massive changes in policy and direction and what we do with flu programs and you know, antenatal uh, pertussis and cocooning strategies and so on. Uh, and yet in any given year more than 100 children in the US die of, uh, of influenza. So certainly you know, it's my hope that at some stage we provide these to all children rather than just Indigenous children uh, because of the importance of this as a, uh, as a cause of very serious childhood illness. Uh, this is the other group that I think we really need to have some focus on. There's a group called SAGE uh, and it's not because that's French for wise, it's because they're the special advisory group of experts for WHO. And about two or three years ago, they came out with a statement that said, in view of the burden of disease, which is great, and the efficacy of vaccine in this group, which is better than in the elderly or in children, WHO has declared pregnant women to be the primary target group to seasonal influenza vaccine. So if the only group your country can afford to vaccinate is a small group, but then don't look at the elderly or children or those with chronic disease, vaccinate pregnant women. And so I think you know, that's an important message to try and get through to our general practitioner colleagues, that this is a critical aspect of um, our immunisation campaigns, getting flu vaccine into pregnant women. Uh, last year when I was still in Canada, uh, we had uh, H1N1 2009 back. Uh, on a given week, I had six pregnant women in my ICU uh, you know, some of them on ECMO for three weeks, uh, you know, ventilated for six weeks, meeting their baby for the first time, you know, at the age of three weeks or not meeting their baby at all because they were delivered to save the mother. So, uh, you know, this is to me, uh, children and pregnant women, something that we really need to push as part of what we're doing. Uh, so let's talk specifically about the immunisation. And in Australia at the moment, that really consists of two vaccines. Variations of trivalent inactivated vaccine and the recently available quadrivalent version of that. And the rationale is probably known to most of you that the immune protection from influenza vaccine declines over time. And so we need to give an annual vaccine to make sure they have optimal immunity. And if you look at the serum antibody, the GMTs in the graph on the right, um, then what you see is that three weeks post-vaccination things are good, uh, but by the time we're getting to the end of 
the influenza season. This is really starting to decline uh, and certainly by the year after, even if it's the same sort of strains in the vaccine, we recommend that people get a booster dose of the same vaccine. It's made worse in and ageing. Uh, ageing leads to a decrease in immunological competence, a thing we call immunosenescence, and they don't respond very well to begin with, uh, and certainly it doesn't last as long. And then, of course, the vaccine strain match issue in that the virus tends to change a little bit each year and we keep chasing the change with our vaccine. So the recommendation is that people have an annual flu vaccine. Uh, and the other major reason for that, of course, is that if only some people get vaccinated, then we get lots of uh, circulating virus in the community and those that are vulnerable are more likely to get uh, infected. Uh, I've heard some of my colleagues talk about the fact that because not vaccine is not as great as it could be, uh, healthy adults should get disease instead of vaccine because then they get a better response and when they're old, uh, they've got protection from having had lots of flu I think it ignores the fact that uh, they become a source of spreading and that in unlucky individuals, uh, you can have a very severe consequence of something that's vaccine preventable. Uh, and I've had the same messages from unbelievers who have measles parties to make sure their children get measles early and, and so on. So, you know, our recommendation is not uh, to get natural disease if you're young and fit. Uh, so if we look at which vaccines we have, vaccines are classified in a number of ways. Uh, one of them is by the virus condition. Most of ours are inactivated, although there is a live vaccine that'll be available in two years here and is used in many other countries. Uh, we only really have two of the virus component types at the moment, um, a split virus, which is the type and the Sanofi type. The virus is disrupted by a detergent, but it's largely all there and the Novartis type vaccines, um, Agripal, Fluad and so on, where they further purify the um, antigens so that you get specific subunits put into the um, vaccine instead of uh, the whole split virion. And they're also classified according to the valency. Uh, during the pandemic, we had a monovalent uh, vaccine. It was only the uh, H1N1. Usually we have three strains, H1N1, H3N2 and one of the Bs and now more recently we have um, access to quadrivalent vaccines with uh, both B strains as well as both A strains. So in Australia uh, the manufacturers, uh, Sanofi Pasteur make uh, both a quadrivalent and a trivalent, CSL make a trivalent, uh, GSK make both and Abbott and Novartis make a trivalent vaccine. And depending on um, what's happening with your private market and what share you get of which vaccines, uh, you may get any or all of those, uh, with the exception that you will always, if you've got flu vax, get some other vaccine as well, because flu vax cannot be given to children under the age of five years because of the risk of increased reactogenicity. So this year, uh, that's a slide of what we've got in there. Uh, two new strains. The California pandemic strain is still there, but we've changed um, both the A, H3N2 and the B strains, the Amagata strain, and the quadrivalent's got uh, B Brisbane uh, as well. And so there, what's in this year is, because we had two different strains this year, it makes it much more difficult for the production process to occur. And we had a real delay, and many people would have noticed that instead of in March, we didn't really start our national program until the end of April. And this has happened before when we've had major changes to the seasonal vaccine that the vaccine companies themselves um, have some difficulty in making sure that uh, they get the timeline that we prefer to see. Uh, flu vaccine is uh, thought by some people to be unsafe if you look at all the data surrounding that. Uh, local reactions are very common, particularly the, the stronger the vaccine you get. Um, swelling, induration, redness and pain. Uh, mild short-lived fever are also um, reasonably common uh, and will occur in up to a tenth of people. And what is rare is an immediate reaction uh, and that is to actually have anaphylaxis as a response to flu. 
there are only two contrary indications to influenza vaccine, and that is anaphylaxis following a previous dose or anaphylaxis following any other vaccine component in an influenza vaccine. We used to believe that because our current production process is in eggs, that this small amount of ovalbumin, about one microgram residual in vaccines, meant that people with egg allergy should not have flu vaccine. Now, the last five years have seen a number of studies in um, North America, but also Peter group at the vaccine trials group did a very good study in Perth. Um, over there, they vaccinated under control conditions 170 people known to have anaphylaxis to egg, and one of the 170 had uh, a small amount of circumoral tingling, and that was the extent of it. So we're really comfortable that people with egg allergy can have a flu vaccine in general practice and don't need to have that sort of intensive monitoring. Similarly, in some places, they're still using multi-dose vaccines and people were worried about uh, mercury and the impact of that on the developing brain and so on. Um, there are no mercury-containing vaccines in Australia. The type of mercury in the flu vaccine, even overseas, is tiny. It's less than one-tenth of the standard mercury in a tin of albacore tuna. Uh, we ask pregnant women to only have one tin of tuna a week. We're certainly not suggesting they shouldn't have a tenth of a tin uh, in an overseas uh, influenza vaccine. So this is a very, very safe vaccine, uh, despite some of the uh, processes out there. Uh, okay, so let's talk about the effectiveness. And clearly, as well as believing that vaccines are unsafe or that the flu is a mild condition. A lot of the debate recently, particularly since Osterholm Review, has been about whether or not this is a good vaccine or not. And we used to have a dogma that said effectiveness is 70 to 90% in healthy adults and less in children and older adults. Okay, hello? Um... So I've logged in from another computer, um, but I can't right. see like the, the like the white screen. I'm going to tell you. Um, so I don't know if whoever's trying to get back in can be muted. But, um, so in 2011, there was a meta-analysis in the Lancet Infectious Diseases done by Mike Osterbrook's group. What they found out was that we had probably overestimated what we believed was the effectiveness of the word setting of flu vaccine in adults. And they came up with a pooled efficacy of 59% in young adults and said that there was insufficient data to put a number on the effectiveness in the young and elderly. They weren't saying it was ineffective, they just said that the way they do their review of RCTs and other studies, they couldn't come up with a number. But their summary was that influenza vaccines provide moderate protection against virologically confirmed infection, but that this is reduced or absent in some seasons. And I'll come to some specific data. And I think there's general acceptance in the flu community now that this is probably right, that our current vaccines work in around about 60% uh, um, of time. And so if we look at what that means, and people saying don't use them at 60%, when we first introduced uh, PCV7, because of the serotypes that were covered, it was about 60% effective against invasive pneumococcal disease and less effective against community-acquired pneumonia. Uh, when we first introduced a quadrivalent human papilloma virus vaccine, because it actually had minimal cross-protection, the uh, Merck CSL version without the ASO3 adjuvant, um, it didn't really do much against 33, 35, 43 and the rest of it, and it was probably running at about 60%. And the early maths data in some countries with the meningococcal B vaccine suggested that it was running around about 60%. So while I would prefer to have a better vaccine, it's not the first time we've been using vaccines that in fact have a good effect, but not are not measles-like in their ability to protect whole populations. So the statement at the end of that, that we need new vaccines with improved effectiveness if we're really going to produce 
good reductions in morbidity and mortality, then I think you know I'm comfortable that that's the state where we are with current vaccines. We have to use what we've got, but we wish we had something better. So let's look at how we improve vaccines. So the first one is what's just become Australia, available in Australia, and that's the quadrivalent vaccine, adding a B. Um, there are different data. It varies from year to year, from country to country, and so on. It's around 20 to 25% circulating strains. It may cause an epidemic every two or four years. The dominant lineage varies. Um, if you pick the wrong lineage in your vaccine by having a trivalent vaccine, then you get very little cross protection against the other one. And while the hospitalisation is less than when H3N2 is circulating, in some years it's higher than with H1N1, and that may be particularly so for children. This has been an issue since about 1983. We used to have only one lineage of uh, um, influenza B, but it's really started to break out from about 1983 onwards, and now we've got both lineages. They both circulate, but the dominance varies. And if we look at the next slide, uh, this is the pattern in Europe, North America, Australia, and Asia, um, and you can see that if you look at the less than 10%, in 2003 4 there was a little bit of B between 10 and 25% in Australia and almost none anywhere else in the rest of the world. Uh, and if you look at 2007, in Australia it was more than half the cases and it was about a quarter of the cases in others. So it really does vary depending on where you are. Uh, and if we look at this next slide, uh, the 2003 uh, onwards, the comparison of what we put in uh, the TIV with what actually circulated. Uh, we can see that in the last five years we've been pretty good at it. You know, we've had uh, between 83 and 98% coverage of our vaccine against the circulating B. But in the seven years before that, uh, we were down around somewhere between 40 and 80% weren't covered by our particular vaccine. Now, this is only the B, remember, because it's not um, what we're circulating. I mean, we may have a very bad match against the circulating B, but be only a small percentage of yes, what's actually happening at the moment. And so the question becomes, uh, will the adding a second B strain produce a great improvement in what's happening? Right, thanks. The safe thing to say is that the benefit of adding a second B strain varies with the age group. It may be more uh, beneficial in children than the elderly. It varies with the effectiveness. I mean, adding a second B strain does not make TIV a more effective vaccine. It's still the same technology. Um, it'll vary with the circulating strains in a given year. And at the moment, all the countries are doing detailed epi reviews uh, to see whether or not they should pay the extra money that it costs for a quadrivalent instead of a trivalent on national programs. This has been marketed heavily across general practice this year. Uh, I think, in fact, to the detriment of flu programs. I've had so many of my elderly, you know, who at a time when quadrivalent was not available, not get their TIV because they're waiting for the new super vaccine that their GP told them about. Uh, which turned out to be the quadrivalent vaccine. So I'll be disappointed if I end up with a lower coverage while people waited for a late arriving uh, QIV. If we see circulate in Australia the same pattern as either Europe or the US, then the additional benefit of having a quadrivalent compared to a trivalent will only be of the order of 3 to 10% because we have in the trivalent the strain that was the common strain in North hemisphere this year. There's a real chance that this whole debate about cost effectiveness will not matter. Uh, certainly in North America, the companies are not intending to make a TIV in future years. There won't be a discussion about will you pay the extra money. Uh, the companies will be offering you QIV at a certain cost. So I think the debate about <coughs> is it worth paying extra money for a an additional uh, uh, B strain will probably not be an issue and we'll be using QIV 
uh, right across the spectrum in the absence of any enhanced vaccines. Um, okay, let me talk a little bit about the other enhanced vaccines and in particular, you know, the challenge that we face in the elderly and getting them protected when they have lower immune responses to vaccine. So the major issue in the elderly is that they have reduced uh, response. They have reduced cross-reactive antibodies capable of attacking mismatched strains. And so the conventional non-adjuvanted TIV has less capacity to protect them. And it's always been a tragedy that the people that we get most vaccine into, uh, our elderly, people in nursing homes and so on, are at least able to actually mount a decent response um, to the vaccine. And this is important not because of the morbidity and mortality about hospitalisations and death. Uh, this is a the concept of catastrophic disability was was first termed in uh, 1997 by Ferrucci uh, in Italy, and it's really been pushed by Janet McElhaney and other gerontologists. And they call catastrophic disability the loss of at least three activities of daily living. Three quarters of people who experience this phenomenon have been hospitalised, and if you look at the leading causes of catastrophic disability. Pneumonia and influenza is the third commonest cause of catastrophic disability. And what that means in the elderly, if you look at the, if the clinical frailty scale, they go from being well without active disease or treated with their chronic disease and they get the flu and they move to moderately or severely frail. And there are many, many elderly who are coping at home, who get the flu and are hospitalised and from there, we look for assisted living or residential care facilities for them. So this is a major impact on your long-term uh, capacity to survive in the community if you get influenza. And there was the classic example uh, a few years back of one of the popes uh, who got flu and then was unwell for six months uh, uh, before he passed away. So, you know, the catastrophic disability is a major factor in the impact of flu in the elderly. So. Uh, let's talk about adding an adjuvant and I want to spend a little bit of time on this because this may well be the first one that, uh, that comes to Australia. Uh, the idea of adding adjuvants is to increase vaccine efficacy and to increase the functional antibody and cellular response and to improve the specifics of the immune response. The other advantage of uh, adjuvants is that it gives us the capacity to reduce the antigen dose and look at novel delivery processes. And this was massive, not in Australia, but in other parts of the world when they looked at how to get enough vaccine for the whole populations during the pandemic. During the pandemic, we had trials with H5M1 candidate vaccines, where even when we gave 90 micrograms, we got a very poor response. But using adjuvanted vaccines, we gave a quarter of the normal dose, 3.75 micrograms, and got a great response with adjuvants. So they enabled dose sparing as well as an improved response. Um, this is the MF59 that I want to talk about. It's the oil in water um, adjuvant that's available in, in the Novartis uh, version of uh, adjuvanted influenza vaccines. Uh, it's one of the two that's been used in recent times. GSK had an ASO3 vaccine that's not licensed here. Essentially, it works at the local level. It produces an enhanced local immune response. It's a chemoattractant. You get more dendrocytes, macrophages and other APCs moving in. It increases the T cell activation and overall enhanced um, response to the vaccine itself. So the first of these that we used uh, were the pandemic vaccine, uh, the ASO3 and the MF59. Uh, in Canada, where I was at the time, the ASO3 vaccine was used uh, in a pandemic right across the board for all ages uh, in Canada. Uh, there was antigen sparing and there was an enhanced immunological priming after one dose and strong Cross uh, reactive responses if they had two doses. Uh, we gave out 70, 33 million doses of this in Canada, uh, and we did that in the background that the special advisory group of experts kept changing their mind. 
they said everybody should use an adjuvanted vaccine. So we had enough to give to the third world. Uh, but they said, don't give it to children or pregnant women. Uh, then when we started seeing the effect of adjuvanted vaccines on children uh, and the poor effect of unadjuvanted vaccines on children, the H1N1, they then said give it to children, uh, but not to pregnant women because we don't know what the effect will be. And then we realised that pregnant women, in fact, were doing really badly with the pandemic. And so they said give pregnant women uh, but try and give them unadjuvanted, and in Canada there was no unadjuvanted, so pregnant women all got adjuvanted vaccine because it was either that or don't vaccinate a priority group. Uh, in New Brunswick, uh, we vaccinated 65% of the pro province, and we vaccinated 80% of all children in four weeks, and the pandemic stopped as soon as we hit that mark. So we had no more cases after four weeks, when we did the vaccine effectiveness review, which is in that uh, reference area in, in IRV, uh, we had no child that got disease after 14 days. Uh, and we had to make the effectiveness a 10 day effectiveness instead of 14 days so that we had capacity to actually do some analysis. There was one child who got sick 14 days after. And so this was you know, a test negative uh, community-based study that actually showed that these vaccines were enormously powerful in that particular setting at doing it. Uh, we went from there to looking at a series of other work. There's a, a live study in Lombardy which was written up in uh, the American Journal of Academiology. Um, 80 odd thousand people in two different groups. Some had adjuvanted vaccine, some had non-adjuvanted vaccine. And what they found was that before the study, the likelihood of being hospitalised uh, when it wasn't flu season was 17% higher in those that received adjuvanted vaccine. They were a sicker group afterwards. During the flu season, the likelihood of being hospitalised in the vaccinated group was 25% less with the adjuvanted than the others. So this was uh, a study that said you were less likely to end up with severe disease if you had an adjuvanted vaccine. Uh, the studies that were done in British Columbia, uh, there was a study looking at the immunogenicity and safety of adjuvanted vaccine, uh, intradermal vaccine, which is not going to be coming to uh, Australia, and normal TIV. Uh, and what they found was that uh, there was more uh, pain with adjuvanted vaccine has an increased local response. You would expect that there's more local activity, more pain. Uh, the rates of redness were similar than with TIV and that you had higher uh, HII teeters for adjuvanted vaccine and that this was statistically significant for H3N2 and H1N1. Uh, <coughs> so the adjuvanted vaccine had a good safety profile and was more immunogenetic against A strains uh, than that. There was a second study, uh, a test negative case control study in British Columbia. In two health authorities, we gave adjuvanted vaccine. In a third, they gave TIV. Uh, it was a tough year to do the study. It was the quietest flu season for 30 years. Half the cases were in long-term care. Half were very old, they were over 85. Uh, we did power calculations and suggested that we'd have to repeat the study because there wasn't enough recruitment. And when we did the analysis, uh, what we found was that, in fact, there was an impact of ATIV and not TIV. If you look at the TIV corrected vaccine effectiveness, it was zero, and the adjuvanted vaccine effectiveness was 58%. And that was higher even in community dwelling than the overall. The overall had a lot of long-term care. The relative vaccine efficacy was 63% of ATIV to TIV. And the absolute vaccine effectiveness was 72% for people outside long-term care. So this study suggested that an adjuvanted vaccine provided significant improvement in protection. Uh, and when we looked at the multivariate analysis, TIV was 42% effective, but it was not statistically significant. And ATIV, about 30% more than 73%. So this was promising in a year that we really ended up 
giving vaccine to a lot of very sick older people. Uh, and when TIV wasn't very effective, we got a good reduction in laboratory confirmed influenza. Uh, when we repeated the study the year later, we found that the vaccine effectiveness with ATIV dropped from the year before. It was down to 56% in communities compared to 72 and 35% in long-term care facilities against 50 odd. What we did find was that while the protection against laboratory confirmed influenza decreased, that the actual protection against hospitalisation uh, was high. It was 56% against community developing. Paradoxically, it was 87% in long-term care, but I don't think this says that uh, uh, it's more effective in stopping hospitalisation because of the vaccine. I think this is the Canadian approach to the management of illness in long-term care. If you're 85 and you've got lots of organ system problems and you are uh, afflicted with influenza, there is a reticence to ship you off to an intensive care unit uh, to try and salvage you from your flu at that particular time. If we looked at the hospitalizations for ATIV against the two Canadian studies that at the same time were using TIV as the basis, 76% overall effectiveness with adjuvanted vaccine, 31 overall with unadjuvanted vaccine. So in summaries, the ATIV discussion, uh, it produces a higher immune response. It induces antibody teeters that persist. It helps against mismatched strains and it significantly improves protection, particularly against severe disease. Uh, I just want to mention before I stop on the enhanced ones for the elderly, there is a high dose vaccine which is available in North America, uh, now in Canada. I don't know if Sanofi are going to bring it here. It's 60 micrograms instead of 15. It's showed improved zero protection. And in a randomised controlled trial, um, the Carlos reference at the bottom, um, sorry, the Carlos reference is the zero protection. The SANG reference in vaccine last year was the uh, vaccine effectiveness in the RCT, 25% enhanced protection against lab confirmed disease, 30% against the actual vaccine strain. So high dose appears to give similar enhanced protection to the elderly than that we see with adjuvanted vaccines. So both of them are not a panacea, but they are going to give you 25% or so protect, increased protection against severe disease. And I think that's important because the extent of the disease in that age group is substantial. And so perfect is the enemy of the good. The additional protection associated with adjuvanted vaccine varies with the antigen, but appears to be around 25%, the same as with high dose. When we have access to these vaccines, there's no case for continuing with TIV in this group. We should be using some enhanced vaccine. So I just want to finish up by talking briefly about the live attenuated influenza vaccine. Not available in Australia, but we expect it to be available probably 2017 at the latest. Our Oster Holmes article, which I mentioned earlier in Lancet Infectious Disease, had a look at the available studies with LAIV and they said vaccine effectiveness was around 83%. It's only, they only looked at three studies, that was all that was available. They were only in six months to seven years, they don't look at later. We've seen a lot of adult data with LAIV that says it's actually less effective than uh, TIV. Somewhere in adolescence, the enhanced benefit of LAIV turns around to being um, a problem. I don't know whether it's post thymus disappearance or whether it's earlier than that. While the Osterholm article and the reviews and the original RCTs in 2005 6 were promising, there have been substantial concerns recently about you know, how valid this is and what we need to do to look at it. Uh, MedImmune published no data from the pandemic, even though it was used. But this year, there were good data out of the US that LAIV work. And the company put it down to a problem with the heat stability of their H1N1 strain. And they said they're looking at their vaccine to try and improve the heat stability in places like Canada and others where they've used it. 
Uh, there's been problems because it has a shorter shelf life than other vaccines. It's 16 weeks. People threw out a lot of vaccine. And then there was reduced demand. I mean, there were parents who actually didn't want to have a live vaccine, even though the absence of a needle. I think by the time it's available to us in two years, we should have uh, some better data from the United Kingdom, which has now decided to give it to all children up to the age of 18. So I think we get two years of data from there. So from a schedule point of view, what does the current information about different vaccines tell us? Um, I think it says if you have it available, you should give an adjuvanted vaccine to children for the first two doses in the first two years of life. You should give LAIV for the next four years uh, and then you should give a QIV because there'll be no TIV until they're 65 before swapping back to an adjuvanted vaccine at the end of life. Now. Um, Lord spare me if I have to try and sell that sort of message to general practitioners. Uh, I'll probably just give everybody CSL. Uh, okay, so we've spent a bit of time on the enhanced vaccines, but the reason I wanted to do that was CSL has purchased the Novartis influenza portfolio. Novartis got out of all vaccines last year, including both the cell culture technology platform and access to MF59. So CSL will own ATIV uh, in the transition in a few months. This vaccine is already licensed for use in Australia, so we could introduce this relatively quickly. The Novartis Managing Director is now going to be the Asia Pacific head for CSL. And so I think there are real opportunities for us to get adjuvanted vaccines soon in Australia, depending on how the transition goes to CSL. Uh, LAIV, as I was saying, is due here by the latest in 2017. We should have enough data to say where should we be using this in children. At this point, I'm not sure whether high dose will come, but it will be as good as the adjuvanted vaccine if we get access to that for the elderly. Uh, question, sorry, I know I've gone pretty close to the end of the hour, uh, but I'm happy to, uh, uh, to stay until uh, uh, people have no more questions if they'd like. So Sarah, do I have to click something different to hear the questions or? Uh, probably the question is, did anybody hear anything I just said? <laughs> yes. No. Can you hear me, Paul? Can you hear me, Paul? Okay. Great. Look, it's Roscoe here. Thanks very much for that. I have the cost of the being stuck up against the light. It looks like it says a program. Sarah, I just got noise. Can you translate the question for me? Is there someone from the faculty still there? So was the, the question was, the, was it the relative benefit of LAIV against something else? Yes, all about cost. All about cost. Right. And, and I think this is going to be... Yeah. LAIV, I don't know what will be here when they bring it in, but it was quite expensive. Um, by comparison overseas, it was running at around about uh, 200 to 250% of the cost of TIV. And uh, it wasn't taken on as the national program, but in Canada, every state makes their own decision. And some of them did actually go with the increased cost because uh, you know, it was sold as a reduction in hospitalizations and a cost benefit process there. Uh, so it'll be interesting to see what it comes out with. It was, you know, I think it's probably been disappointing after the original RCTs as to uh, you know how much better it is and, and whether it's worth paying a lot of extra money for it. 
Audio. Audio. But I think it's an exciting time in flu vaccines. You know, we've struggled with this old TIV stuff that really doesn't work that well in the people we desperately want it to work with. Uh, and so, you know, I'm hoping that, uh, you know, we're at the start of a brand new era. While I'm a bit sceptical about, you know, the regular outputs from academic institutions about how close they are to a one-shot-for-life universal vaccine, I think we are getting closer to stuff that will work better in the community. Uh, if there are no other questions, I will thank people for dialing in. Can I say that after 35 years of medicine, uh, this has been by far the most stressful thing I've ever done. And uh, when someone says, I have some fancy technology for you to try and navigate, I'll be going, no, no, we're going to do this by teleconference next time. <laughs> thank you, Paul. Thank you. Thank you, Thank Paul. You all. It was good. Thank you. Thank you for the discussion, and we'll see you for the conference maybe next month.